Uh, welcome back to day two of the colloquium. And we're really lucky we start today with Dr. Brian Ahern. Uh, Brian graduated from MIT, studied superconductivity, went on to the Air Force. And in fact, he received the first patent in cold fusion. Brian Ahern. I'd like to begin by thanking Mitchell, Gail, and Peter Hagelstein for hosting us today. This is a, a fine opportunity for us to get together, people of like mind. I'm a little worried, though, that you'll think I'm pompous beyond belief for the story I'm about to tell you. But I was thrown into extraordinary circumstances four times. And I'd like to tell you about that, because I think LENR is something extraordinary that we have yet to figure out. But I think some of this may help you in your understanding. In 1973, there was an announcement in Warsaw that palladium hydrogen and palladium deuterium had different transition temperatures that went against the prevailing BCS theory. Well, everybody assumed, well, they made a mistake. Well, that became my master's thesis topic, to repeat the work from Warsaw and to find out if they had made a mistake. And in 1975, I found that palladium deuteride had a transition temperature of 11 degrees and palladium hydride had one of 9 degrees. BCS theory said it should have been the other way around because the hydrogen going into the metal palladium makes palladium superconduct. But in reality, the hydrogen going into palladium, the palladium is just a nice nest for the hydrogen to superconduct. It's a completely different way of thinking about the problem, but that is what really happens. So the, the BCS theory wasn't wrong, it just it made no predictions about anything. So in 1983, Johnson, MIT professor was asked to write an invited article for the International Conference on Superconductivity to be held in Zurich in 83. But in April of 83, at my laboratory, another scientist made a presentation in Washington saying there never will be a useful superconducting supercomputer. And he took for his backup information from IBM. And IBM had a $100 million a year program. AT&T had a $100 million program. Sperry Rand had the same. They closed the program when they, for very good reasons, superconductors don't like to do AC. And if you want a fast computer, you don't want a superconductor. But everybody was afraid to say that. So that killed the program. It died. Then in 86, after Johnson made his presentation in Zurich in 83, he said, if you want really high temperature superconductors, I suggest you look in the perovskite system. And he gave a piece of the perovskite to Alex Mueller, who was the host of the conference and the head of research at IBM Zurich. Three years later, Bednos and Mueller discovered the high temperature superconductors in the perovskite system. They won the Nobel Prize in 87, and nobody ever heard of Johnson. But in my lab in 87, they, we broke into groups. We all tried to make these black powders, press them into pellets. And after about 10 days, we all succeeded in making a high temperature superconductor. But my lab director came to me and said, Brian, we want you to take the lead to find out where these things are going. They're already at 100 degrees Kelvin. Can they go to room temperature? And I said, why me? What do I know? You know? Well, my title was solid state physicist, but I never felt comfortable about that I knew anything. He says, we don't expect you to figure it out. We expect you to find someone who's figured it out so we can make a recommendation to DOD. So that became my job. And I had an enormous budget. I mean enormous. I could pay a person $5,000 for a one-hour lecture. And I was doing that because I could get away with murder. So I had them come in. The great theoreticians of the world would come in about every couple of weeks and give a lecture on why these things worked. But after about six months of it, I was despairing because I couldn't understand any of them. And I was walking across uh, Harvard Square, and I saw an old professor of mine. I was his teaching assistant for quantum mechanics in 78. And 10 years later, I asked him if he solved the problem, if he knew anything about it. And he told me he had solved it in 83. Well, I went and read his paper. Couldn't understand a line of it. Couldn't understand the BCS theory either. But <coughs> His wife was an architect, and I had a building company, and we had reason to get together. So I would meet his wife and customers for lunch, and Johnson would come along. And after about six or ten meetings, I figured out what he was doing. 
and his understanding of superconductivity was so basic <coughs> that I could explain it to an average high schooler, <coughs> although I couldn't understand it reading it for my own value. So as a result of that, I made a recommendation to my lab that we should not fund the high temperature superconductors. That is, they work at high temperature, but they're good for nothing because they're so fragile. The higher you go in temperature, the more fragile they become, and we shouldn't fund them. So the DOD closed the program. They didn't fund any of it for, for years, and nobody knew why. And because they weren't worth anything, my knowledge of why they worked wasn't worth anything. It wasn't, you know, why would I share with anybody because that in 395 gets you a latte at Starbucks. <laughs> so I took the knowledge, though, from how the superconductors worked into studies of nanomaterials. And it allowed me to understand nanomaterials in a very fundamental way. So instead of being embarrassed about being a solid state physicist, I felt like I knew something. And uh, we started seeing correlations about the properties of nanomaterials when they get to be very, very small. They act very differently. They act like superconductors in terms of their vibrational modes. Normally, materials vibrate at very small amplitude and high frequency. But when you get to 5 to 10 nanometers, the nuclei vibrate like this, slow and large. <coughs> and also the vibrations are cooperative. They communicate with each other. And I knew that, and we were seeing all kinds of properties, and we were building light-emitting devices that would take advantage of particles in that size regime. Completely different physics when you're there. We learned harmonic oscillators. These are anharmonic oscillators, and they have very different properties. And that, in 395, gets you a latte at Starbucks. <coughs> but then in 2008, 2009, I heard about Arada, who came to the country and made a presentation saying that he was getting heat out of nickel and palladium nanopowders in the 5 to 10 nanometer region, size regime. That was the sweet spot we had identified. And when I heard about that, I immediately dropped what I was doing, and I said, I'm going to repeat what this fellow is doing. I didn't know who he was. But right after his presentation in 2008, Akito Takahashi got up and made a same presentation, and he found that they didn't see any excess heat but his powders were 20 to 100 nanometers. So I communicated with him over January of 2009 saying, if you get to 5 to 10, you'll see the result. And by March they had done that, and they saw the improvements. So Takahashi, I mean, excuse me, Arata put his powders in the door. He would add hydrogen. The temperature would go up, and then it would never come back to room temperature. It would stay 1 or 2 degrees centigrade higher than room temperature indefinitely. And that's what I set out to do with the Electric Power Research Institute funding. I made the same powders, and the material science for doing so is something we can discuss at lunch. But basically, you make a tinsel, you bake the tinsel, then you grind it and it turns into a black powder. And that's the powder that, that uh, inhabits that doer. And when you put... Uh, thermocouples in there, heated with hydrogen, it'll warm up in an exothermic reaction, but when it cools back down, it did not cool back to room temperature. So I had 14 experiments in a row that showed this excess heat effect, but it's a negligible amount. So we said, well, we've got to kick the doors on it somehow. So I tried going to higher temperature, and the effect improved. We went from 100 milliwatts up to 5 watts. But it's nothing to get excited about, because I'm putting in 80 watts just to heat it, and I'm seeing 85 watts, so not very exciting. And there's the powder. This is just an SEM micrograph of a grain. This grain is typically about 75 microns. There's one about 15 microns. And each one of these grains will have about a million islands of nickel in them. This is a TM micrograph that Takahashi performed on my powder. You can see the uh, error bar here is 10 nanometers, so we're clearly in the right size regime, and this indeed showed lots of excess energy. In fact, this powder exploded in my door, so I had an event, and it, you know, it blew out the door and burnt my house quite a bit. My wife wasn't too excited about that. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so that was pretty much the end of my uh, experiments, other than I said, I want to take the, door, the powder, put it in the door, 
And this is an uh, electrically isolated dual. You see the ceramic at the top, so we have an electrode at the top. The dual would be the ground, and I was going to put high voltage pulses. Make a switch of light. Sorry, I thought he was going to show. Okay. There's nothing special about it. The door just had some heating tape on it so I could heat it if I wanted. The powder would be in the bottom. And then I would try and put high voltage pulses. But before that, I had to find out what the breakdown voltage was. The electrodes were one centimeter apart. Average breakdown was about 700 volts. So I had a power supply that could do 2,000 volt pulses, 0 to 20 kilohertz. So it was a great big power supply. I ran it, and it burnt out the power supply in 60 seconds. What would you do if your television burnt out? You're not going to fix it. And this was a mysterious high voltage power supply. I had no chance of fixing it. And I thought I was out of luck. And I was going to use high voltage pulses through magnetic nanopowders. The nickel is magnetic. And I have samples up there you can see at the break. Uh, and a fellow named Arthur Manellis came to my lab in Massachusetts from just 30 miles away in Pelham, New Hampshire. He heard I was doing high voltage discharges through nanomaterials, and he volunteered to assist. He had a key, similar interest, and he was putting pulses through magnetic nanoparticle systems. So I went to his house in September of 2011, and he had a car. Um, I'm not, this is preposterous, but this is what I did. He had my equipment. He took the power supply to fix, so I went up to see him, and he had a sports car that was electric. And we took it for a drive, 25 miles, with four passengers. And we had a battery capacity measurement at the beginning. And then we let the car sit for a week, completely encapsulated and isolated from anybody's view. And it recharged itself, which is preposterous. It seems like a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And, but that's the business we're in. So it, over a week, it put out 3.4. 3.8 kilowatt hours, and this was the power supply sitting in the trunk. I'm surprised that's out of focus, but we're not going to see the details anyway. But underneath this piece of white paper was a great big billet of barium ferrite, which I, I brought to show you folks uh, at a later date. And he was sending high voltage pulses through wires around that, that ferrite billet, and it was creating an excess of electricity. There's just a different view of it in the trunk. We used data logging voltmeters, and we attached them to the battery, and we just watched the battery recharge over a week. You can see a steady increase, but it had dips in it. Those are substantial dips. Those are, represent uh, tens of thousands of joules. And we later traced this to a uh, aurora borealis effect, the fourth largest of that year, and that was the first largest why there was any interaction between this device and the magnetosphere, we don't know, but there was an exact correlation. This is a second test he allowed me to do with a 60 watt bulb. I ran that for six days, and the battery didn't discharge. It increased its voltage. And he allowed me to do more and more experiments. But that test was 57 watts of continuous light output, and the voltage went up, so we said it was probably putting out 60 watts had been operating for 20 months, so this isn't something that doesn't go on for some time. It was nanograin strontium ferrite. We found out it was strontium ferrite. We haven't verified whether indeed it is nanograin, but we supposed it was. This is just a graph of voltage versus days. The first two days shows a lot of noise because he was driving the car. Then we attach the, the light bulb, and you can see how it, the voltage just goes up a little bit over that four-day period. Here's the most important physics. We put thermistors around the trunk of the car, three of them, then we put one on the ferrite billet. Now, the ferrite billet was acting like the core of a transformer. And you know transformers always run warm. The bad ones run hot. And this one ran 3 to 5 degrees C, colder than the environment. We didn't expect that. We weren't looking for that. We wanted to see how much it was heating. But while it was operating, there was a what we call a negative hysteresis. So that's some important physics that we observed, but we don't understand. 
Arthur was working on this by himself, and he refused any investment money. We had proposed many millions of dollars to increase the effort, but he met with his family and he said they wanted to keep it to themselves and work on it just by themselves for the next year. But coming about nine months in, on September 23rd, he sent an email to us saying, now it's time for you to take over, Brian. He wanted us to go forward and make the investment. And two days later, he had an aneurysm, and he is, you know, non compass mentis now. This is his device, which I have on my dining room table. <laughs> and the family asked me on September 26th, could I go out to Belmont, New Hampshire, and turn it off so it wouldn't burn the house down, because nobody knew what it was doing. But after it was off, it was, it was not fully put together. He had it disassembled. So it's at my house now, but I, it's, it's a black box. But I'm telling you, there was three scientists, including myself, who made these measurements. I believe in the measurements as much as I believe anything I've ever done, you know, but I don't know why it worked. This is a, a picture of a billet that has uh, some structure to it in terms of the multiple poles in the magnet, and when you wrap that over three different axes and send high voltage pulses through it, it's performing in a way that we didn't anticipate. I think this is the last slide. I believe from my studies in nanomaterials that the rules that cause something to become a superconductor are kind of antithetical to that cause something to be a ferromagnet. They're, they're different electron orbital properties. And there's nobody in this room that understands the orbital properties for superconductivity. And there's also no one here who understands the orbital characteristics for ferromagnetism. But Johnson figured that out back in 82 and 83, and again in 395, and I get you a latte at Starbucks. But if you try to understand the molecular orbital characteristics of what makes a ferromagnet, what happens to those materials when they get to 5 to 10 nanometers? They behave differently. They behave cooperatively. So there's a new form of magnetism that was just first discovered in 2006. And now nature has a journal called Nanomagnetism and Spintronics. We're still trying to figure out what these are, but the magnetic storms are created only at this size regime. So I'm saying to you that we can anticipate new and exciting properties <coughs> from these kind of magnetic interactions that may be the root cause of what we see in LENR. That is, they may promote other processes that lead to what we've seen for 25 years. That's all I have. Do they have charge on them? Is there any no, they don't, need, they don't need charge. No charge at all. They don't need any charge. Things vibrate differently. Electron orbitals move differently. They move in concert over large directions. So you can have very different magnetism, extremely different magnetism. And, but I'm not the guy to, to do that. Oh, just on your super ferromagnetism, you don't really have to have nanostructures to generate that. You can do that with very well annealed iron. You can get some of the same properties that you show here. I'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, yeah, just a quick comment to the ferrites. The ferrites and Chieso electric systems, uh, Carpentieri uh, in Torino, has been crushing rocks. And when they're ferrites or Chieso electrics, he has spectacular numbers of uh, nuclear transmutations that he measures directly. So that's his experimental stuff, and I'll just say it. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I've taken down the numbers. Five to ten. <laughs> Nanometers, right? Everything in nature lives at five to ten nanometers. That's something that's too big for this discussion, but this every be, enzyme is five. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you only did it in fourth. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry.